Hello and welcome to the spiritguides.co.uk network radio show with your host Mark Chatterton. Tonight we are pleased to welcome onto the show Andy Thomas who is a leading light in what is known as the truth movement. He is an author and mysteries researcher who has written several books including his highly acclaimed The Truth Agenda. He regularly lectures in both the UK and overseas and has appeared on several TV programmes in the UK as well as being one of the presenters of the Glastonbury Symposium, one of the longest-running alternative conferences. So a warm welcome to you, Andy. Right, thanks. I'd like to start by talking about crop circles, as you've written quite extensively about them, including the book An Introduction to Crop Circles. Now, crop circles are one of many unexplained phenomena in existence today, is that where it all started for you, or were you into the world of the unexplained before this? I think crop circles were a really important sort of catalyst for me because, I mean, like everybody else, I'd heard of them, I had some awareness of them, but, you know, this was back in the late 80s and whatever, and I didn't really sort of find them coming onto my radar. Now, I was interested in sort of unexplained mysteries and that, but only loosely. I was very much caught up at that point uh, with the world of uh, writing music and playing keyboards because that was what I was doing at the time. Uh, and it wasn't till the summer of 1991 that I was down in the West Country and, you know, there were so many crop formations around that I was just suddenly completely hit with the scale of this. And I think what was extraordinary to me was that nobody that I was speaking to could tell me where they came from or what they meant. Uh, and that immediately intrigued me because I think where there are questions, you know, instantly I seem to be interested. And, you know, through the crop circles and then my, whatever it is now, nearly 21 years, I suppose, of uh, trying to come to terms with them and gather as much information on them as I could and share that with other people. Um, I suppose it was through them that I became aware there were lots of other mysteries going on. Uh, and I think, moreover, I realized that the crop circles were very badly dealt with in the media. And I mean, it was only... Um, just a few weeks after I became involved that the newspapers were suddenly full of the uh, stories of Doug and Dave who were these two retired gentlemen who said that they'd made all of the crop circles. Well, I knew even just in those few weeks of research I'd done already that that just couldn't be true, uh, which I stand by to this day. Uh, and so I had a bit of a baptism of fire and, and then met up with other people who were also on that same level saying, this is just wrong, you know, we're being mistreated here. So it was an interesting sort of way of getting into that realm of being able to question things and face the ridicule uh, by using evidence and not just shaking your fist. Uh, and I suppose really, you know, that's what I've done with lots of other subjects ever since. So certainly the crop circles, yeah, were very important to me uh, on that score. Yeah, so I was going to ask you um, about crop circles, which you know, appear every year now, ever since sort of the 1980s on a regular basis, especially in Wiltshire, uh, as well as other places around the globe. Would you say that your viewpoint is still the same as it was all those years ago, or has it changed over the years towards crop circles? Well, I mean, uh, you know, obviously we have to face the reality that the debunkers have been very successful. Uh, and a lot of people have been persuaded that, you know, either the whole thing is just a man-made joke or some of it, or at least it's very, very good human art. Uh, and, of course, that is the case with some of them. Everybody would accept that. Um, but I've always maintained, and I still maintain, that there is a, a significant proportion of these crop formations that you just cannot explain that way. When you look at the evidence around them, and that can range from everything from eyewitness accounts to biological anomalies going on inside the crop to sightings of strange lights coming down from the sky or, you know, very importantly, the time frame under which they appeared. And we've had huge formations, hundreds of feet across, appearing within very short periods of time, something like 45 minutes, um, when we know that man-made formations can take many hours to make. I mean, on some occasions, you know, nine hours plus sometimes less to be sure but this is where you start to realize that you know when you make a comparison that there is a, a 
still a phenomenon here to be studied. Now, I've always maintained that. As I say, I, I had to deal with the Doug and Dave issues very early on, and people have been telling about crop circles. Of course, they read the newspapers back in the autumn of 91 and said, ah, there you go, mate, you've been fooled. And I knew somewhere deep down that that wasn't the case, and I suppose it made me more determined to try to get down to, well, what is the evidence? Um, you know, let's accept that some are man-made, but what about the ones that aren't, in my view? And I, I still hold to that today. For every man-made formation, you've got another one that is not so easily explained. So where they come from beyond that is, of course, the big mystery. And I've never, ever reached a conclusion to that, which, of course, sounds rather weak at first glance. But I think it's an honest conclusion that you can decide whether they're made by extraterrestrials, extra dimensionals, natural energies, whatever you think's making them. But you've got to be able to prove that. Uh, and I've never been able to come up with absolute proof of you know, these theories being the correct ones. So I remain open-minded. I stand in the middle. But the one thing I would say, and that hasn't changed, is that there is a mystery still going on. For all the debunking, for all the criticism they've had, you just cannot explain all of them away, in my view. Right, that's a very good answer, actually. Um, you do mention crop circles in your book, The Truth Agenda, which is also the subtitle, Making Sense of Unexplained Mysteries, Global Cover-Ups and 2012 Prophecies. Before we go into detail about some parts of the book, could you tell us what led you to writing a book of this magnitude? Well, I mean, over the years, uh, when I started to get involved with crop circles, I, I began to be asked to give talks which I had no experience of doing whatsoever, but I thought, well, you know, why not? I'll give it a go. Uh, and it turned out that there was a lot of interest in the subject. So I found that I was then giving more and more talks, and then often you'd be asked back, and I was thinking, well, I can't just say the same thing. So I found myself getting drawn to look at the other connected phenomena, other mysteries, and realized that actually there were a lot of threads which bound all of this together. And sometimes if you follow those threads, they would lead you to some very interesting places that maybe you didn't expect. And before I knew it, you know, I was also getting to know people like Marcus Allen, who is the UK publisher of Nexus magazine, who has a very broad knowledge of everything from, you know, Egyptian mysteries to questioning the NASA moon landings to New World Order conspiracy theories or whatever. And then, of course, through other people I met, either through Marcus or, or through the crop circle world, I realized, okay, there is a case here to be answered on a number of fronts. And as I began to give talks about that, I realized that there were certain ways that you could approach this material, because the public reaction is often to deny or to ridicule or just say you're mad. Um, and I realized that if you present something sensibly and as balanced as, as you possibly can be and include as much evidence, not hearsay, but evidence as you can, I realized, okay, you can make a case for this. And actually, the public will not always reject it. I think we've sort of got into a viewpoint in shall we say, the alternative world that will always be shouted down. Now, I haven't actually found that to be true. It comes down to the way you present it. So as for the truth agenda being born, that really came out uh, of a talk I started to give, trying to give a broad overview of, you know, mysteries and cover-ups. And I realized I really want to be able to recommend to these people a book. And now, which one shall I recommend? And the more I thought about it, I couldn't quite think of the one to start with, because a lot of them are, you know, very good, but very dense and very complex, and I think would put people off. Equally, you've got the other end of the spectrum that you find in the discount stores, you know, these cheap, pathetic books, which are basically debunking conspiracy theories. And I thought, okay, I'm going to have to have a go at writing this myself. So... That really was the germ of the idea, so I started to put something together that would not embarrass people who were already into this. It would be a good overview for them too, but equally that you could hand it around and say to people, start here. This will give you the big picture of why it is people are questioning the world that they're in. Uh, and what can I say? I mean, I wrote it and I had no idea whether anybody was going to read it, but so far uh, the response has been very positive and I think what's shall we say, the most gratifying thing of all is that it seems to have worked. It, it seems to have reached out to both sides, new people and those already committed to these ideas. 
and it's accessible. And so far, the reviews and responses have been almost sort of universally positive. So, you know, it was something that could have been disastrously awful, but I'm pleased to say that the response has been very healthy. And uh, it, it's there for people that want that starting point or want that good overview. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are worse places to start, I guess. Right. Um, one of the biggest mysteries of all that, you obviously discuss in the truth agenda is that of UFOs and aliens. Um, it's now been over 10 years since Dr. Stephen Greer in America held his famous news conference where various people who had worked in the military gave testimony to all that they had seen concerning the reality of UFOs. The idea of this press conference was partly to bring about the idea of disclosure, that is admittance by the authorities to the general public, that aliens do exist and contact has been made with them. With the exception of several big Hollywood films over the last 10 years or so, it looks like things are never going to change here. Would you agree? Well, it's funny, isn't it? Because, I mean, Stephen Greer's done a marvellous job in many ways with what's known as the Disclosure Project, trying to get an official admission that there are unexplained objects flying around, that there is some kind of extraterrestrial presence. I'm certainly in Stephen Greer's view. Um, but it's a funny thing, you know, from the earliest time, and me being involved with this, uh, when I first um, got together with a bunch of people down here in uh, East Sussex and we started to uh, form our own crop circle group, you know, every other week, I think, or month, whenever we had a meeting, somebody would come along and say, this is going to be the year of disclosure. This is the year the government's going to say, yes, it's all real. And I suppose I've heard that so many times and realized that actually it never really happened. I suppose that I've sort of got the long view on this, that I think it, it would be such a huge statement to make to come out and say, actually, we we're lying all, the t all along, you know, yes, it is real. I think that's only something that could be done with a lot of subtlety and possibly a, a lot of time. And, of course, some people think we're being conditioned to get used to the idea that there might be aliens and that the debunking is almost part of the double bluff. You know, it's making us feel comfortable with something that actually, if you were to have incontrovertible proof that we were being visited by other beings, I think it would be very frightening to a lot of people even if those beings were very positive, wonderful creatures. And, of course, some believe they are. Others believe they're not. Others believe that there's a mixture of good and bad, same as anything else. Um, and I think that that's an important point, is that if it was to occur, and, you know, ships were to be hanging over every major city in the world, I think the psychological impact would be massive, even amongst people who think they've got used to the idea of aliens. So... I think the notion that it will just take a few press conferences to nudge the authorities into saying anything, I think is probably a little bit overhopeful. And that said also, of course, you've got the other people that believe that the whole idea of aliens is in itself a conspiracy theory put about to mask some kind of New World Order plot. Uh, I mean, there are people like Ian R. Crane who has put forward the notion that maybe the authorities, the powers that be, might even try to stage a faked alien invasion with a view to encouraging you know, the very quick formation of a one-world government. So this is where it starts to get tricky, because even if you suddenly did find the ships hovering over all the cities in the world, um, would you know for sure that they were alien, or would it be some kind of hologram technology? And this is the crazy rabbit hole that you can go down in the alternative world, because... The truth is you wouldn't know for sure, and, and we'd need to really sit for a while and see how our guts felt about it. So, you know, there are many, many issues raised by those seeking disclosure on extraterrestrials, and um, I suspect we're not quite there yet. But then again, there's been a lot of predictions for this year, 2012, so who knows? Maybe there'll be some kind of shift on that, but we shall see. Yeah, okay. Um also in your book, you look at several well-known conspiracy theories, including the moon landings and 911, of course. Um, you go into great detail with those. But for some reason, you, you didn't really dis, uh, talk about the death of Princess Diana in your book. Was there any particular reason for this? 
<laughs> it's funny you say that because I'm actually working on a book at the moment, which won't be out to next year. We're actually going to that in quite some detail. Oh, okay. <laughs> and the reason that I didn't in Truth Agenda was, I mean, it's in there. I mean, if you read it, it's yeah, certainly yeah. referred to, was that it was almost, sort of, particularly when I started writing it, it was all still quite raw, and it was almost I needed myself to get a long view on it, uh, and I felt that there were so many other things that to me were more important, like 9-11 especially, I mean discussing the anomalies present in the official story of that, to me are more important than, you know, raking over what happened with Princess Diana, which isn't to say that that doesn't matter, because I think that it does, but I felt at that time that it wasn't quite where I was at. And now I do. And it's funny, I've been looking into that just recently. Um, and, I, you know, I can see some of the wider threads going on with that. And so that's, funnily enough, one of the things I've been working with just recently. And uh, hopefully, can't give a title or any news at the moment, but uh, sometime next year we, we shall see some fruits of that. Uh, and, of course, it looks into many other things besides. But you've always got that issue, what do you include, what do you not include? And I mean the moon landings, I thought they were very important to go into because although a lot of people absolutely ridicule the notion that maybe they faked some or all of the moon landings, and yet it's an important thing because if you can show people that we've not been told the whole truth about something that is so massive in our collective human psyche, you know, this achievement of standing on the moon. If you can actually show, and I believe it can be shown, that there are some very questionable anomalies, especially in the images, then, of course, you're going to rattle somebody. Because if they can also see it too, what you've done is sort of pull the rug on, on their whole idea of what consensus for reality is. And in the book, I call that section, you know, deconstructing consensus reality. And I'm using the moon landings to do that. Not to say we didn't go to the moon. I can't say that. I have no idea. I hope that we did. I was quite excited by it at the time. But just to say that when you look at the evidence for the claimed conspiracy theory, it's very easy to dismiss unless you look at that evidence you realize there's more going on than you think. There's certainly a lot of gray areas that, you know, they deserve serious investigation. So, you know, yep, these are the reasons why I kind of went for them rather than stuff like Princess Diana, rather than raking over the JFK stuff again. But that's not to say that, you know, there aren't things around those that would also be interesting. And uh, I guess this is sort of what I'm working towards now. Right, that's very interesting. Obviously, there's... a growing interest amongst people about the world of conspiracy theories. Are there any examples that you could perhaps give us where so-called experts have debunked a conspiracy theory, yet in the end it's turned out to be true? Well, I mean, you could argue, of course, that you know, the so-called experts debunk virtually every conspiracy theory. Uh, and, I mean, the problem, I suppose there is how we phrase it when we say something turns out to be true. It depends whose consensus you're listening to, really. I mean, if you take 9-11, I mean, the fact is that there are many prominent academics, uh, architects, engineers, scientists who are writing some very serious academic papers saying basically the building should not have fallen in the way we saw Basically, there are many, many major anomalies on just about every level. And that's an unusual thing to happen because, for instance, like chemtrails, one of the problems with the belief that these chemtrails are up there to poison us is that we don't yet have enough sort of academics coming forward saying, yes, this is absolutely the case and here's why. Now, that hasn't yet happened. I'm not saying it won't, but it hasn't yet. And so that keeps that very much on the fringe as far as the mainstream is concerned. But 9-11 is different because you have got people who have started off very often as skeptics uh, you know, thinking absolutely that the official story was true, if you want to put it that way, sceptic, who has then looked at the evidence or reluctantly been persuaded to look at it, and they thought, oh my God, actually, I cannot deny what I am seeing here and reading. And so as far as they're concerned, then, yeah, they, they are proving the case. But the problem you've got there is that, of course, the authorities are never, well let's say in a long time, I suspect, going to suddenly say, oh, yes, you're absolutely right, it was all a big setup. I don't believe that's going to happen anytime soon. It'll only happen if something 
so violently is exposed that it's just undeniable, and maybe that will occur. But I think you could argue that actually has happened. In the 9-11 conspiracy theories are debunked widely and often in the mainstream, and yet, if you look at the polls taken um, on the 10th anniversary just last autumn, I think it's something like over 50% of the world's population no longer believes the official story of 9-11. So, in fact, the conspiracy theorists, on that at least, are now the majority. As indeed it often is the case. I mean, in fact, if you take the Princess Diana theories, so yes, officially the inquests and the inquiries say, no, it was a drunk driver, that's all there was to it. Well, the public doesn't believe that. And at the last count of a, a poll over Princess Diana, I believe just a couple of years ago, 90%, 90% of the British population at least believe that she was assassinated. And similar figures with Dr. David Kelly as well. So you can say that something's debunked, but that's not the same as the public actually believing that. So, you know, it really depends on which side of the fence you sit on or decide to put the emphasis on as to when you say something has or hasn't been debunked. But I think looking at the polls is often very revealing. And then you realize that the version of reality we presented with it in the media is a false one. Because very often more people believe in that kind of thing than you might imagine from what we're told. That brings me actually on to the, the, main, the next point, because one of the main themes of your book is the gradual erosion of ci- civil liberties and freedoms, especially as a result of events like 911 and 77. The man on the street might find it hard to accept, but would you argue that it is part of a plan or conspiracy by an, an elite few to take over the world? Well, I mean, you could argue the elite already run the world. I mean, you know, this notion they're going to take over the world. I mean, well, they already have, if you want to look at it in the broad sense. Uh, I mean, this is where it comes down to questions about who we're dealing with. And, and I discuss in the truth agenda, I hope very openly, we don't entirely know exactly what the plot is here or what they're up to. But, you know, there are clear threads that lead you to believe there certainly is an elite of some kind. Now, whether that elite is the Illuminati, high degree Freemasons, reptilian lizards from outer space, it actually doesn't matter what you decide as long as you just accept that you're dealing with the same thing nonetheless, which is, you know, very few people basically pulling a few strings here and there to make sure that sort of their mandate, if you wish, is followed for the world rather than ours. And I think if you just ask that question, you can see clearly that is happening. And even if you believe the official story of 9-11, for instance, even if you do accept the official story, the upshot is the same, that it was used heavily to justify many questionable Middle Eastern wars and massive withdrawals of freedoms that we basically just took for, you know, took for granted in the West. That has happened, even if you believe the official story. As it happens, I do not. And therefore, I do go down the view that, unfortunately, you have to say it was almost certainly part of a manipulation to give them more power, to, you know, make us all afraid, to be able to generate the war on terror, which has taken away so many fundamental liberties, certainly in the West. So... When you look at things like that uh, and all the other related things around it, yeah, you have to say, I think we're very rare. Hello? I don't believe. Uh, hello, you're still there? Yeah, yeah, just suddenly yeah. died. That's okay. Uh, in the same way, I don't believe that we've been told the truth about uh, Libya or indeed even what's going on in Syria now. I think it's only when you can look back on these things that you very often realize that there's another story going on. And even if some of these events are real on one level, I think they're very often manipulated or used to uh, serve the needs of the few, shall we say, rather than the many. Okay. Um, Obviously, in your book, The Truth Agenda, you you go into detail about 2012 and the various prophecies concerning it. What's your view about what might happen on the 21st of December this year or indeed even before that? Have you got any particular fixed views on this or are you you sort of quite open to different possibilities well i mean i've been studying 2012 for a long time and uh, i worked with jeff stray 
in putting together his Beyond 2012 book. So this has been a part of my life for quite some time. And I mean, I've always maintained the, you know, the simplistic view that any one person knows exactly what's going to happen at any one time is unlikely. I certainly believe there was a cycle for the ancients. And it wasn't just the Mayans, because everybody talks about the Mayans. There were many other ancient cultures around the world that had this cycle of time, this 5,125-year cycle of time, somehow embedded in their calendars, in their psyche. And they believed that there was change. Something would come along and change things whenever this ended and began again. And some have linked that to astronomical cycles, to solar cycles, whatever it may be. Um, but nonetheless, I've never read anything that says everything will happen on one day. I think this is a notion that's crept in because a calendar has to end somewhere and it has to begin somewhere. So 21st of December 2012 is when you calculate the old calendars, taking all the changes, Julian, Gregorian, year zero, all of these things into account, and some people think that we don't, but we do, the date you get is 21st of December 2012. But nowhere is it written that that is the day everything happens. And I think anybody that's going to sit on a mountain and wait for the world to end that day is probably going to be disappointed because I suspect what we're seeing here is a more gradual process. Everybody can feel change. There is certainly a lot of change bubbling up around us, politically, socially, and in the Earth itself. I mean, the news has been full of solar activity and the northern lights in the last few weeks. Some say we're going to see a lot more of that, and it's profoundly going to affect our planet. If you get a big solar flare in the wrong direction at the wrong time, it could even you know, knock out all our electrics and take us back to the Stone Age for a little while. You know, anything could happen. But this notion that it's all going to happen on one day, I, I think, is something we need to be careful of because I think a lot of people are building up huge expectations that, you know, the raising of consciousness or their move to the fifth dimension or however they interpret these shifts that we're going through, if they're expecting it all to happen on one day, I doubt that it will. I think we're seeing a more gradual process that just happens to be the turning point of the cycle. And certainly, you know, the media are not helping because the media are already very loudly scoffing, saying, oh, ho, ho, here we are in 2012 and the world didn't end. Well, number one, it's not supposed to be till the end of the uh, year that the big changeover is. And number two, who said the world would end? There's a Mayan prophecy that uses the phrase about the end of the world, but, you know, maybe they're using it figuratively, symbolically. Lots of other cultures didn't see it like that. And, you know, we should certainly remember that the Mayans, in fact, called the day of the changeover creation day, not destruction day. It was creation day. They saw it as the beginning of something new, moving into a new era. And I suspect that's more what this is about. And certainly, you know, I believe there is change which we've not seen quite at this accelerated rate for some time. And I think a lot of people feel that too. And if all the 2012 phenomenon does is to encourage people to think about their own lives, think about themselves, and create change within themselves in anticipation that maybe something will happen, then that in itself is a change. That is in itself part of the shift. And as such, the whole speculation around 2012 is valid. It's been worthwhile. But I certainly think we should be very cautious about being simplistic about it. And, you know, when we get, as I'm sure we will, to the 22nd of December uh, and the world hasn't ended, yeah, some people are going to have to reevaluate things if they put everything onto this very simplistic view. But uh, I think the thing is to take the wider view. Now, certainly, if you look at the astrology of this year, for any listeners out there who are interested in it, I believe astrology is much more statistically significant than anybody in the mainstream gives credit for. Um, if you look at the work of people like Helen Sewell, I mean, she has pointed out uh, a lot of things about the recent times we're in now. She was saying this years ago that have actually come true about the social shifts, about authority versus, you know, those that want to stand up for themselves or rebel. And, you know, there's a lot of hopes and fears for this year. We've got the Olympics. We've also got the Diamond Jubilee. And there's certainly a feeling bubbling up about, God, what if something goes wrong? What if something happens that isn't so good? 
And you don't want that to happen, but it's an interesting one that if you look at the astrology of it, if we get through this summer without any strife, particularly here in England, well, we'll be doing very well. And we need to be on our guard as to how we respond, because if you then go back to that whole sort of new world order mandate that people feel is going on, uh, something we are deliberately stirred to riots, that we're stirred to unrest. And that when that happens, of course, then they can justify all the draconian policies that they want to bring in. So we have to also be careful that these energies, if you want to call it that, are not misused this year. Uh, And so you may see a lot of social stuff going on, even before we even get to the 21st of December 2012, uh, just based on the astrology alone. And it's certainly a very, very interesting area that uh, I would recommend people find out more about. Yes, because Ian and I were at one of your talks a few weeks ago and you you mentioned about the horoscope for the Queen's Diamond Jubilee celebration weekend that it's not looking too good then. Are you able to say any more about that at all? Well, I mean, I am not the astrologer, but um, from what I understand, yes, they've managed to pick about the worst weekend they could have picked astrologically to have a big celebration. Uh, You've got a full moon in a very sort of dynamic but in a kind of a negative not quite the right word but it's a slightly dangerous dynamic aspect uh, to which I can't go into the details here but it's interesting they chose that weekend to celebrate it and those aspects are really not dissimilar to what we had when 7-7 was occurring uh, in 2005. Now God forbid that we see anything like that again. And, you know, we have to hope that just by talking about it, it makes it less likely to happen. I think that's true for a lot of the hopes and fears that people discuss. As for the fears, some say, oh, you shouldn't think about it. Don't even go there. But equally, if you can voice them and get real with them, I actually think it might make it less likely that anything would happen because it would be almost too obvious. But certainly, yeah, it's, we need to be very, very cautious because people have been saying for years, well, what if they stage some horrible false flag event? And then, you know, Britain, certainly the southeast and London's going to go into security lockdown. Uh, you know, you could, it's not too much of a stretch to imagine if something happened during the Diamond Jubilee, that by the time you got to the Olympics, we'd be living under virtual martial law. Now, I hope that doesn't happen. I hope I'm totally wrong and it's absolutely marvellous and we get to the end and it's all jolly and wonderful. I hope that it is. Uh, I'm certainly not one of those people that wants disaster to come. I'm actually not. I like a quiet life, you know. But we just need to be conscious of the potential dangers uh, and just be on our guard and try to send out as positive a vibe as we can to you know, counter any potential bad roads that people might try to take and just be constantly discerning and conscious of our own place within it so that we try and generate some kind of positive matrix you know, rather than a darker one. Yeah, because I was reading uh, the other week that um, when the Olympics are on, there's going to be a lot of American troops allegedly guarding the American athletes in London. That seems quite unusual, really, to have all foreign troops on our soil. Well, certainly the amount of troops that they're bringing in is, I mean, it's several thousand, you know, 30,000 was one figure I heard. I don't know if that's accurate or not. Um, and there's, there's certainly a lot of fear being sort of buzzed up around the Olympics. And the fact that they have also installed surface-to-air missiles around the stadium really does make you wonder. Because, I mean, there's been two sets of Olympics since 9-11, uh, and, you know, so we've been in the war on terror years, if you like, for a long time, and I don't remember there being this amount of kind of fear surrounding an Olympic. So it's almost as if they're, they're instilling it by putting in the missiles, by putting in so many troops. Yeah, you have to say it's almost like they're trying to rile people to some reaction, or worse, they're expecting something, they're planning for something to happen. Uh, and I really hope that doesn't happen. But of course, you know, those that are very into the sort of occult symbolism of the Illuminati uh, and, you know, the ruling elite, whoever they may be, have pointed out some just curious things, two of which are that the Olympic mascots do bear a slight resemblance to the all-seeing eye over the pyramid, which you get on the dollar bill. 
which a lot of people, of course, think is a, a very sort of key Illuminati symbol. Uh, and if you go one stage further, if you look at the lighting, um, which goes around the edge of the Olympic Stadium, uh, each one does seem to look a bit like a big eye on a pyramid. Now, maybe this is a joke or it's just a complete coincidence, but, you know, those that get a little bit disturbed by this kind of stuff think it's almost like somebody's trying to send a message of who's really in charge here. And maybe this is madness. Maybe we'll be laughing about this in a year's time. I hope so. But it's just interesting to note here and now that you know these are the kinds of things that are running through the collective. And they certainly don't help themselves by announcing you know, they're going to have surface-to-air missiles and all of this. I, I certainly think that that cranks up the negativity rather than takes it away. Uh, and that's a shame. Yeah. OK. Um, going back to last year, you... You brought out an updated version of your book, The Truth Agenda. Can you tell us why you did this and what new things you added to it? Yeah, for sure. I mean, so Truth Agenda, the first edition, did much better than I was, you know, imagining them in my best dreams. And so I needed to bring out uh, another version because I thought, well... Because when you're dealing with stuff going on in the world, of course, it's constantly shifting. You know, you can't really bring an up-to-date book out on this kind of stuff because stuff's always moving on. So I took the opportunity to just kind of reflect more what was going on, you know, uh, uh, when uh, the new edition came out, which was uh, last summer. Uh, and, you know, the, the, therefore it covers stuff like the fact we now have a coalition government, Gordon Brown's gone. You've had some stuff like Climate Gate going on. I felt that needed referring to, that needed looking at, because there's a chapter in the Truth Agenda about the whole green dilemma. You know, what is this global warming argument really about? Uh, and why has, you know, the man-made global warming thing been so put on us? Whatever your standpoint on it is, whether you believe in it or don't believe in it, it's interesting to see how, again, that's been used for purposes of control. So that's discussed in the book, but there have been a few shifts and changes there, so that needed adding in. And there was just a few references and a few extra little bits and bobs that I felt would bring it up to speed. Uh, and, you know, just correct one or two little things that uh, I let go in the first one. So uh, really that was, the you know, the purpose and um, just to sort of constantly keep it up to date. And I'm hoping there will be another edition of Truth Agenda at some point. Uh, and again, I will keep updating it all the time. People want to keep reading it. Um, you know, every time it comes out, it will hopefully get a, a little shot in the arm. So we'll see where that goes. OK, um, I must mention the final chapter of the Truth Agenda, because obviously what we've been talking about and things you've been saying about the, the summer, especially with the Olympics, it can be quite sort of worrying. But you do um, end the book on a, a very positive note and you look at the idea of people power and how, how the different events have changed things led by the people. Um, what would you say to people listening tonight who might be concerned about the future and what's going to happen and what should we as individuals be doing perhaps? Well, I, yeah, that is a very good question to ask. I mean, that's why the whole last part, not just the last chapter, the whole last part of the Truth Agenda is looking at, okay, what do we do? How can we be positive and actually sort of like balance, you know, all of the darker things that might be going on? And I mean, I'm much heartened by the experiments that are going on today with collective consciousness. And people have realized that, you know, the human thought, when it's focused, has... Uh, an effect on the energetic environment around us. If you look up the Global Consciousness Project, for instance, which began at Princeton University, it shows that when lots of people focus their thoughts with intent especially, they can make computers react uh, with no physical connection between the two. And this is where you realize that what we think, therefore, does change the world. And therefore, when we think together, what we think is shaping what's going on around us. And um, I think we're too often knocked down like dominoes into negative patterns being set by those who maybe don't have our best interests at heart. So what we have to do is reverse that process and start to tip some positive dominoes of our own and change the pattern. And I've always maintained that if everybody stood up tomorrow and said, this just isn't working. I'm going to take some responsibility. We'll all do our bit to create a happier world. It would happen because I think the trouble is the fear, the despair, 
and if you turn on the news, that's pretty much all you see night after night, can make you think there isn't a better world and that there's no chance for one. And you do wonder sometimes if that isn't in itself part of the conditioning. I don't believe that. I believe the world at heart is a good place. Most people are good. They want to get on with their lives and want to let other people live their lives. It's only a few that seem to be on these power games. And sadly, we too often dance on their strings. But if we cut the strings and said, well, I'm not going to do that, I'm actually going to start my own creative, positive energy here, which, of course, some people do. If everybody did that, I believe it would have a huge effect. And those who are doing like work and healing and whatever it may be are doing real work, and everybody needs to do it. But you also need to match that with action, positive action. Because, I mean, you can send as much love and light as you want to somebody who's holding a gun at your head. But, you know, you might need to take a little bit more action in that event. Uh, so I think we need to also, we've got to balance the positive thinking aspect with action. And history shows, and as the Truth Agenda points out, when lots of people stand up and say, enough of this, we're going to do something really good, it works. And it's so often where you get positive change, whether it be, you know, solidarity, standing up for themselves in Poland, or whether it be the guys that put Live Aid together. Whatever it is, it goes to show if enough people just say, we're going to do this, then it's almost as if the seas part and these big sort of edifice authorities that you think can't ever be moved suddenly crumble away. Because there's actually not that many of them. And I think they rely on our apathy, which I think has been fostered as well. I think we are fostered into thinking we can't make a difference. We're conditioned by what we watch. I think we're affected by what we eat and the very questionable chemicals that are in a lot of our food. But you can still rise above that. It's not so bad that you can't actually wake up and see what's going on. If everybody did that, I think the world would change tomorrow. And I do believe that the 2012 phenomenon as I sort of alluded to earlier on, has actually helped this process of people thinking, yeah, I don't want the world to carry on in the way it has been. I want something better, and I'm going to create it. And that's the key thought. It's where you say, I'm going to help do this. Because if everybody says, I'm going to take my little bit of responsibility here, even if it's just affecting the lives of those around you and your family or where you work or whatever it is, being you know, not afraid of ridicule, to be able to stand up and say, listen, I question this thing we all take for granted. I have other views on it. Do you want to listen? And you will get ridiculed sometimes, but you'd also be surprised at how many people will go along with it and say, you know, now you say it. I've always thought like that, but I've never thought I could openly say it. That's something I've heard a lot. And, you know, if everybody just did this and says, I'm going to make a difference, even if it's just a one person in my life, you know, then the world changes. The collective consciousness experiments show that's how it happens. We're all little cells in one big body. And, you know, it only takes one or two in the body to go wrong and you can be in trouble. But equally, it only takes one or two to do something amazing and suddenly it transforms the whole being. And, and I think that's the matrix, if you wish, that we're living in today. We just haven't realized it. So we need to take back that power and realize that we can make this a wonderful, positive ride if we want. It, it's down to us to choose it. Right. I think that's a really good, positive thing to end on. But... Uh, that's been one of the most interesting interviews I think we've ever done on on the um, Spirit Guys. But thank you very much, Andy, for that. And um, we'll put all the details of your website because uh, I know you do do quite a lot of talks and presentations around the country. And I'm sure people listening might be very keen to go and hear what you have to say. But And also your, your book, of course, The Truth Agenda, is a, a very good read as well. So thank you very much, Andy. For, for it's a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you very much.